Hello everyone and welcome to this course on fuel cell and ultra capacitor for electric vehicle. The automotive industry in the recent past has gone through a very interesting transformation. Success of companies like Tesla and their innovative technology in battery electric vehicle has changed the dynamics of a market that has been dominated for a very long time by conventional traditional automakers. This has also opened the doors for many other electric vehicle startups like Lucid Motors. But what has been the driving force for these changes? Apart from increasing levels of global warming, strict legislations imposed by governments all around the world, and the search for a sustainable solution for transportation are the main factors driving these changes. The governments around the world each year have been making the emissions norm stricter and stricter, reducing the acceptable level of pollutants coming out of vehicles. Also, we have a limited amount of resources when it comes to oil. So we need to find ways that are sustainable and that can go longer. And hence, this search for alternative fuels and alternative powertrain has come into picture. And in this search for alternative powertrains, a fuel cell electric powertrain is one of one such candidate and that's been explored quite heavily in the automotive industry so in this course we will go into depth of what a fuel cell is and how it works in the electric vehicle so let's get started so let's have a look at what we will learn in the first module of this course we will have a look at how the fuel cell was adopted across the industry and not just the transportation sector we will briefly have a look at how the fuel cell works and what it does. And as we progress in this course, we will dive deeper into the functioning of the fuel cell. We will have a look at different architectures for a fuel cell vehicle. An architecture is essentially the way different components in a vehicle are arranged and how they are interfaced with each other. We will have a look at various suppliers and developers of a fuel cell. These are the companies who have invested a lot of time and over the period of time they have become experts in the development and production of fuel cell. We will briefly have a look at ultra capacitor and how it functions and as we progress in this course we will gain deeper knowledge of ultra capacitors as well. And lastly we will give a glimpse of what you would have achieved at the end of this course. So what knowledge you would have gained and what kind of tools you would have used at the end of this course. Let's have a look at how the fuel cell has been adapted across the industry. The automotive industry can be divided into two segments, a passenger car segment and a transportation segment. So let's have a look first at how the passenger car segment looks like. The fuel cells were invented back in the 1800s, but at that point of time they were big components and not quite fit for automotive purpose. But there has been a continuous research and development by many companies that still continued. The major breakthrough came when General Electric invented the proton exchange membrane fuel cell and this is the kind of fuel cell that's being used in the automotive industry currently. But even before the fuel cell made it to this automotive industry, it has been preferred by the space industry. So NASA began using fuel cells in the space missions in the 1900s. ISRO as well has developed expertise in the fuel cells because of their space exploration missions. The Japanese OEMs like Toyota and Honda have been the early believers of the fact that fuel cells are a very good power source for the vehicles. They began their research and development on the fuel cells in the late 1980s and 1990s. Toyota in fact has been one of those OEMs that firmly believes that fuel cell vehicle powertrain is a better alternative compared to fully electric vehicle. They have been working with the governments to improve the infrastructure so that the market share of the fuel cell vehicles on the road can be increased and that in turn will help the acceptance of the fuel cell vehicles by the general population. General Motors in US is another OEM that has invested a lot of time and resources in the development of research and development and has done decades of research on it and is one of the OEMs in US that has been supporting the fuel cell initiative. Premium German car makers that are known for their high quality engineering have also seen the potential in this technology 
and they have invested heavily in the development of fuel cell vehicles. Mercedes have launched fuel cell vehicles with their A-class and B-class variants. So what they have essentially done is they have taken these existing vehicles and taken that platform and modified it so that they are able to swap the conventional powertrain with the fuel cell powertrain. Audi sometime back released a very successful battery electric vehicle called the e-tron and they have taken this platform and modified it to, to convert it into a hydrogen fuel cell based platform known as the H-tron. BMW just like Toyota is one of those OEMs that believe that fuel cell electric vehicles are a better alternative than a battery electric vehicles. In fact BMW only really launched a BMW i3 which was the fully battery electric vehicle and since then they have moved their focus into development of hybrid electric vehicles which consist of a conventional engine and an electric motor and now as the time progresses they are moving their focus onto development of fuel cell electric vehicles. They have developed a few prototypes but they are due to release a production ready model by 2022. Hyundai is also another company that has done decade-long research and development on the fuel cell vehicles. They launched the fuel cell variant of the Hyundai Tucson in 2009 and they have since then continued development and they launched the second generation of fuel cell vehicles called the Hyundai Nexo. Jaguar Land Rover has also committed to development of fuel cell vehicles and perhaps in the future we will see that they also have a fuel cell variant on the market. So having studied the passenger car segment, let's shift our focus to the transportation industry. By transportation industry, I mean buses, light duty trucks and heavy duty trucks. For a passenger car, you have many models in the market and you have many alternatives for the powertrains like battery electric vehicle, you have hybrid electric vehicle, you have plug-in hybrids, you also have mild hybrid electric vehicles. But the vehicles in the transportation sector they are still heavily dependent on heavy duty engines and these engines use diesel as primarily their power source. And till now we haven't been able to find a sustainable and a more environmentally friendly alternative yet. You can obviously create a battery electric truck but it doesn't make a lot of sense commercially and let's have a look why. In this graph that you see on the right on the x-axis you have the range of travel which is the distance traveled by a vehicle and on the y-axis you have the total cost of its development. Now if you look at this green line which is the line denoted for battery electric vehicle to increase the range of travel you would have to increase the cost for its development as well and the increase in cost is mainly due to increasing the amount of battery capacity. The more battery cells and the more battery modules you add, the more expensive your system gets. But on the other hand, if you look at the blue line, which is the fuel cell electric vehicle, if you look at this region over here, you can think that for a shorter range of travel, perhaps battery electric vehicles seem to be a more cost effective option. But at this point in the graph where the two lines intersect, anything beyond this line on this side to the right, you can see that to be able to increase the range of travel and still keeping the total cost of development in control, a fuel cell electric vehicle seem to be a better option because in a battery electric vehicle, the cost increases quite rapidly and it's proportional to the range of travel, but that is not quite the case in fuel cell electric vehicle. And for this reason, a fuel cell electric powertrain is a more commercially sensible option for buses, light duty trucks and heavy duty trucks. But cost is not the only factor. Keeping the cost factor aside, the charging time is also a very important factor to be considered in development of the powertrain for transportation industry. You have a normal passenger car that takes a long time to charge your car. If you have access to a supercharger well and good then you can charge the car quickly but it's still not a matter of few minutes like it is for refueling a fuel in a diesel truck. You will still have to wait for quite a long amount of time to be able to charge the battery and with a very big battery the charging time also increases proportionately. So the downtime of these vehicles would be quite long. So imagine you are a passenger and you're going from one city to another city in a battery powered bus. Imagine waiting one hour 
or even more so so that your battery of the, the bus is fully charged so you can continue your journey doesn't sound very appealing right similarly if you are in the business of transporting goods you often have scheduled and delivery deadlines to meet for your goods and a longer downtime for the vehicles required for charging which will mean that you have delay in the delivery of your goods but on the other hand if you have fuel cell trucks then you can fill up the vehicles quite quickly and continue your journey the companies involved in the transportation sector have identified the benefits of fuel cell powertrain for the buses and trucks in terms of its total system cost and reduced refueling time compared to the disadvantages of a very high system cost for a battery powered bus and truck and also prolonged charging time and they have responded accordingly Hyundai is working alongside H2 Energy which is an organization in Europe and they have worked on a deal to supply 1000 fuel cell trucks to Switzerland the image on the right this is how the truck is expected to look like when it's finished and still supplied. Scania, which is a Swedish truck developer, has also seen the potential and they have developed fuel cell truck and they have deployed them in Norway and they have done successful trials for them and then they are going to further progress that and convert that into a full scale production. Nikola Motors, which is a relatively younger company which has been recently founded in the US is developing a 40 ton truck which will be completely powered by fuel cell this company has no background of developing heavy duty diesel based vehicles and this company was founded purely with the purpose of developing fuel cell trucks and promoting the fuel cell technology very recently apart from goods transportation truck they have also announced a pickup truck which is what normal consumers drive and that is also powered by the fuel cell. General Motors was working alongside US Army and for the US Army they have developed a pickup truck as well which is a fuel cell based powertrain. In India Tata Motors has developed a star bus with a fuel cell powertrain. They have done this in collaboration with ISRO using the expertise that they have gained through space exploration missions. The image at the bottom that you see are the images of that star bus developed by Tata Motors. The image on the left is what the bus looks like in reality. The image in the center is the anatomy of the bus. If you look at my mouse cursor, the cylindrical objects that you see on the top, these are the hydrogen storage tanks. And all the hydrogen that is necessary for running this bus stored in these hydrogen tanks that are placed on the roof of the bus. And at the back of the bus is where the powertrain is located and that is zoomed in and showed in the picture on the right over here. At the back of the bus is where all the components like fuel cell and all the supporting components that are necessary to run this entire system are located. If we expand the boundaries of the transportation sector, we will see that the use of fuel cell is not just limited to transportation on land by buses and trucks. Apart from buses and trucks, the train industry is also doing a lot of research and development develop fuel cell power trains similarly to the one that you see on the image on the top right for a long time now trains have been powered by diesel locomotives especially in the areas where there are no overhead cables thus making it impossible to run electric locomotives and in areas like this fuel cell trains can provide a greener alternative to transportation the best part of this is that there is no additional infrastructure needed like installing the overhead cables that you would need for electric locomotives and these trains can run on the existing infrastructure. Germany already has passenger trains that are operating on fuel cell power. There are many cities in Europe where there are only electric trains that are operated. So if you are someone who is living in the suburb of these cities you would first have to take a train that is probably powered by diesel to get to a hub and from there you would have to get on a train that is powered by electricity to get into those city centers. As a passenger, imagine the hassle of changing trains multiple times just to get to the city center, even though the distance may not be that much. But if you replace those trains with a fuel cell train, then you can travel from one point to another in one single journey. That is quite a convenience, right? Alstom and Siemens are among the major players that are working in the development of fuel cell trains. 
but they are still not limited to transportation on land. As you see on the image on the right, there are marine vessels that are going to be run by hydrogen fuel cells in the future. The one that you see is under development and we can perhaps expect to see that in the new feature actually becoming a reality. So what did we learn in this session? We saw how the fuel cell has been adopted by the passenger car industry and how there are many companies that have already produced production ready vehicles and how there are many companies that are working towards it. Then we saw the use of fuel cell in transportation industry. We saw how it makes more sense in terms of cost and in terms of the time needed to refuel it. And then we continued and saw the potential that it has for running trains and also marine vessels. As we continue in the next session, we'll learn about the fuel cell itself and how it works. Stay tuned. Hello everyone and welcome back and welcome to this module on life cycle analysis. In the previous module, we created the Simulink block to process the acceleration and brake commands and we also created the remaining pieces of the whole Simulink model that use the wheels and the brakes and then eventually convert all of that signal into the traction force which is what we need to propel the vehicle forward and so after doing all of that we, we had the complete Simulink model for the fuel cell electric vehicle simulation. We also had a look at how do we initialize the model. There are some constants and some areas that we need to define in the workspace and those values are referenced by the Simulink model. So we saw how do we load the mat files into the workspace so that we can run the Simulink model and also we saw how to save some of the variables or some of the values generated during the Simulink so that we can plot some results and analyze our simulation. Up until now we have been focused purely on the engineering part of this whole fuel cell electric vehicle. We had an understanding of how the fuel cell works, the chemistry behind it and all the engineering behind it. We had a look at how the batteries and ultra capacitor work and all of the materials and it, the processes that happen inside these components. But that is not enough because the industry is shifting its focus away from just tailpipe emissions. Until now, the entire approach has always been to reduce the tailpipe emissions and so that gave birth to zero emission vehicles like battery electric vehicle and fuel cell electric vehicle. But without analyzing whether the entire process of manufacturing, using and then re recycling the components of it, this whole process should eventually reduce the carbon footprint. And that is where life cycle analysis come into picture. So let's get started. The industry is moving away from the tailpipe emissions because Although tailpipe emissions do cause carbon emissions, and but they are not the only thing creating the carbon footprint. And so the issue that we really need to address is reducing the carbon footprint and not just reducing tailpipe emissions. Because tailpipe emissions will reduce the carbon footprint locally in the cities where they are being run, but not globally. Carbon dioxide is emitted during the manufacturing phase and also in the supply chain phase of the production of these vehicles. You have a lot of metal and material like plastic and rubber that goes into the manufacturing of these vehicles. And so how this manufacturing is taking place and where is the material coming from, it all matters. And so for these reasons, the industry is now moving away from just the tailpipe emissions and adopting an approach whereby they address the carbon footprint at each phase of that, uh, the whole process of the vehicle and its entire life cycle. So the automotive industry is widening its approach and it's widening its field of view and so it's including the carbon emissions in all of these steps that eventually work towards creating an electric vehicle. And so a lot of carbon emissions actually happen before the vehicle gets on the road and even before it's being used. So unless and until we reduce the carbon emissions that happen before the vehicle is even manufactured, we won't be able to address the issue of global warming. Also, a vehicle has a certain amount of lifetime, 1 lakh kilometers or somewhere around that. And so at the end of the lifetime of a vehicle, 
you have to do something with the vehicle and so that's why the parts are recycled the metal can be melted and can be used in some other purposes uh, or can be used again in the creation of parts for the vehicles but the recycling also doesn't happen on its own and the recycling part also creates carbon emissions also perhaps not all of the parts have to can be recycled so the parts that cannot be recycled how do we deal with the disposal of those things all of these things matter in the life cycle assessment of a vehicle and so that's where the this holistic approach of the life cycle assessment aims to reduce the carbon footprint in all the processes and because we are looking at the carbon emissions before the vehicle gets on the road while the vehicle is being driven on the road and also what happens to it at the end of its lifetime this entire approach gets this name of life cycle assessment so let's understand life cycle assessment in the form of a picture you have the vehicle that is being driven on the road and th this obviously generates carbon dioxide depending on the kind of vehicle but assuming for the conventional vehicle that run on any kind of petroleum product or cng or lpg they all produce some kind of emissions but the fuel that is being used to run these vehicles the fuel production also has a lot of carbon emissions related to it if we just talk about petrol and diesel we have to get the crude oil from the ground and the mining of this crude oil creates carbon dioxide and carbon emissions once this fuel or the crude oil is obtained we need to process it in the refineries and those refineries also create some kind of global warming and so the fuel production phase also has carbon emissions and as we discussed even before it gets to the vehicle we have created some some kind of carbon footprint beforehand similarly as we discussed for the manufacturing phase as well there is a lot of carbon dioxide emissions that is being uh, emitted for running the factories and for processing the material and also just assembling the parts of the vehicle and this whole process also creates carbon dioxide and once the lifetime of the vehicle is over the components have to be recycled and waste has to be disposed so the waste disposal part aside whatever we can recycle will help reduce the carbon emissions in the long term because the mining of metal from the earth and all the processing and metallurgical operations that are done on the metal before it can be used they will not have to be done and so at some level the re recycle reduces co2 emissions but not so much and so this entire process starting from here until the end of the life cycle of the vehicle the amount of carbon emissions it will produce is different and so a lumped up term for this whole life cycle is called a global warming potential so how much global warming will an entire life of a vehicle have start from the manufacturing and fuel production phase until the component cycle that is uh, given a term of global warming potential so the diesel vehicle will have a different global warming potential than the vehicle that runs on either cng or lpg because the fuel production for those two is different and also manufacturing you have a different kind of tanks for those so for different although the vehicle emissions might be different the entire life cycle global warming is measured in global warming potential the environmental impact of a powertrain as we discussed is measured using global warming potential but let's understand what it is in a bit more detail the heat absorbed by any greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is compared to how much heat the same mass of carbon dioxide would produce and that is what becomes the global warming potential the global warming potential for carbon dioxide is 1 and so this is measured in co2 equivalent so any different gas that will have a different kind of global warming potential and so the to have a common baseline for how much heating it will create we use the term for global warming co2 equivalent let's understand that with the help of an example consider a gas that has a global warming potential of 100 which means that it will absorb 100 times more heat than co2 for the same amount of gas so 2 tons of gas will have a co2 equivalent of 200 tons so you just take 2 and you multiply that by the 100 and so the co2 equivalent of 200 tons means that 
you have to have this much amount of CO2 to have the same amount of heat that is absorbed and thus resulting in global warming. We briefly saw the phases that are involved in the life cycle assessment which is the production phase, the use phase and the recycling phase. But even within the production phase there are some um, divisions that are further made which is this is called the cradle to gate. The cradle is basically where things are born and that is raw material extraction. And so from these raw materials you are able to create the components. From the metals you can create the chassis and the body of the, the vehicle. Using silicon you can create the glasses and using fiber you have the fiber enforced glasses for the windows and the windscreen and things like that. You have rubber and all of the other components extraction and then converting into uh, components. And then these components go into vehicle production and this is called gate to gate. Um, part of the production and this whole process is cradle to gate. So you have the uh, potential to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in all of these phases. But this vehicle production is typically owned by the OEMs because the factories are owned by the companies that produce the vehicles. So if the companies that make vehicles adopt environment friendly processes and they source the raw material in a good um, sustainable manner then they can reduce the gate to gate uh, carbon emissions and this can help reduce the production phase carbon emissions. We have seen the fuel production carbon emissions uh, so electricity or fuel that is used to power the vehicles this is also divided in two parts this is called well to wheel which is the whole uh, fuel production to fuel use part. But just the part where the fuel is being produced is called well to tank because that's the emission that is from the drilling of the crude oil until it gets to the tank of the vehicle. And once it has reached the fuel tank of the vehicle, from the tank to the wheels where the vehicle is being driven, the amount of emissions created in that phase is called tank to wheel. So for example, the tank to wheel emissions of a battery electric or a fuel cell electric vehicle is going to be zero because there is no tailpipe emissions. But for petrol or diesel, this is not going to be zero. And so this process also adds to the emissions in the use phase. And similarly, depending on the material being used in the car and the process is adopted for recycling, it will have some kind of carbon footprint as well. For any solution the automotive industry comes up with, it has to satisfy three criteria so that we can actually address the, the issue. And the problem that we are trying to address over here is global warming and it is not just tailpipe emissions. So if we want to reduce the global warming in the long term, any solution that we come up with has to be sustainable. So we should not come up with any kind of solution that is going to work only for the next few decades and then we switch over to something else. As an example, the battery electric vehicles are seen as a, a problem to this global warming solution. But if we do not think this properly and a few years or a few decades down the line we actually find out that battery electric vehicles is not the right option, then we will have to come up with a completely different solution. And that is not sustainable. So anything that we do and any solution we bring has to go on for a very very long time. It also has to have economic viability because any solution that we come up with, if the companies are not able to produce vehicles that can generate profit for those companies, it is again not going to work because nobody will put money into it and that, that solution will just die down. Also, the actual problem which is for the emissions reduction, whatever solution we come up with, if it does satisfy sustainability and economic viability, it also has to be low in emissions. And only when these three criteria are met, we will be able to reduce the global warming and increase the health of the human beings and the because of the improved air quality in the cities. As we saw that we use a lot of material in the production phase of the manufacturing of the vehicle and that adds to the carbon emissions. So having a good supply chain that do, does not add a lot of global warming potential is very important in reducing the global warming potential of the entire life cycle of a vehicle. So we start with the raw material. If we want to produce anything we will mine the material from the um, the ground and that will be converted into ingots and that ingots is then melted and given the shape of various components of the vehicle. 
but it's not just limited to vehicles uh, the the metal anymore the modern electric vehicles whether it is just battery electric or fuel cell electric or even plug-in hybrid electric vehicles they contain a lot of power electronics and these power electronics run on a lot of semiconductors like silicon carbide and so on and so forth so all the processes that is used to mine even these material adds to the uh, supply chain carbon emissions so the raw material extraction is also it's a significant factor once these raw material is obtained we need to process these material so again not just the metal even semiconductors and things like silicon carbide or even rare earth metals that are used in these power electronics they need to be processed and the the processing of these material also creates carbon emissions once again and then you make the components out of these materials that you have mined and processed and so component manufacture again increases carbon footprint once all of these components are manufactured you would integrate them into the vehicle so that it forms the complete vehicle and then it will be in in use when the vehicle is being driven so if we are actually increasing the carbon emissions in all of these phases where the processing takes a lot of carbon the extraction of raw material takes a lot of carbon and even component manufacture might take some extra carbon where does the break even point come if the battery electric vehicle manufacturing is very highly carbon intensive then the vehicle has to be driven for a certain amount of time or a certain number of years before we can actually get a payback of the carbon that we have already emitted before we have even manufactured the vehicle and that is why the supply chain of the vehicle production is important and has to be closely monitored for the manufacturing of lithium ion batteries we need to mine lithium and some rare earth metals that go into the manufacturing of these batteries and these processes generate a lot of chemical waste for the purification or just the processing of these minerals and uh, these rare earth metals are also used in electric motors and uh, these electric motors are not present in conventional uh, diesel or petrol vehicles but they are present in battery and fuel cell electric vehicle and so we need to consider the carbon emissions for the manufacturing of the motors as well and that's why the supply chain and its global warming potential matters the image that you see on the right over here is um and it's it's a lake filled with chemical waste that is generated by processing of these rare earth metals and these rare earth metals go into all the components that we use right from our smartphones to our laptops because they all contain batteries so if we manufacture a lot of battery electric vehicles in one year then you can imagine the waste that we will be leaving behind even though the vehicle itself is clean but its supply chain is leaving behind so many chemical waste that is not handled properly and so that's why government regulations on handling this chemical waste that is being produced for the components used in battery electric or fuel cell electric vehicle is very important until we stop these kind of uh, scenarios from happening in on our planet we are not really helping by creating battery electric vehicle or any alternate fuel vehicle for that matter so cradle to gate environmental impact is important and it should be addressed by the manufacturer because they are the ones that source the raw material the extraction of raw material and the handling of the toxic waste should be done responsibly the manufacturing of smaller components has to be done in a way that the assembly plant doesn't leave behind a lot of co2 and also the logistics of the supply of this material to the factory is also something they need to monitor and it's not just the material also the paint that is um, used on the cars they contain some kind of organic compounds and they also need some processing and they have some environmental impact as well and so switching to more environmental friendly paint is also something the uh, car manufacturers are doing these days to reduce the overall impact on the environment this uh, image over here shows the relative global warming potential in the manufacturing or the total use of the vehicle throughout its lifetime the production of a conventional vehicle has less global warming potential compared to an electric vehicle and also the fuel cell vehicle is something that you can see over here so this dark blue box it's the global warming potential in the production phase so as you can see over here this is the global warming potential for an ic engine vehicle run on gasoline and diesel 
and this is for the battery electric vehicle and for the fuel cell electric vehicle so the manufacturing of ev has more global warming potential because of all the lithium and rare earth metals and all the semiconductors that are used in, the, in that and currently bev and fuel cell electric vehicle bev has lower global warming potential compared to a fuel cell electric vehicle the fuel cell electric vehicle will have a lower global warming potential overall than the, the conventional vehicle by 2050 and so this 2050 bar that you see over here the total is 105 and the total for a petrol vehicle is 217 so by 2050 the overall impact of running a fuel cell electric vehicle for its lifetime will be about half than a conventional gasoline or diesel vehicle and that is one of the reasons that uh, the companies that manufacture vehicles are looking to switch for diesel and gasoline to fuel cell electric because battery electric vehicle is not that everybody can have based on where they live and their accessibility to, to charging infrastructure and electronics also add to the global warming potential as we discussed which is the basic reason for the uh, battery electric vehicle to have a higher manufacturing phase global warming potential so let's quickly conclude the things that we have learned in this video the industry is is widening the field of view and looking at all these steps that are taken to produce the vehicle and also recycle it at the end and it's not just tailpipe emissions the entire solution has to be a long-term solution rather than just a short-term solution the supply chain affects the emissions in the manufacturing phase so the material used in all of the components used in a vehicle should be sourced responsibly the efforts should be made at every step so that we are able to reduce global warming and not just tailpipe emissions so in this video we have only addressed the vehicle manufacture part of the life cycle assessment and as we move forward in this module we will also look at other parts of the components of a life cycle like its fuel production and its recycling so stay tuned hello everyone and welcome back in the previous video we had a discussion about the life cycle analysis we saw that the industry these days is not just focused on the emissions during the operation of the vehicle but before and after that and we had a brief discussion about the emissions that are happening in the manufacturing phase of the vehicles which relate to how the raw material is mined and how it is processed and we saw that different kind of components necessary for the creation of um, fuel cell and battery electric vehicle like the rare earth metals the lithium and these kind of material the processing they create more carbon emissions than a conventional vehicle and so the overall manufacturing of a battery electric vehicle and a fuel cell electric vehicle is more than the internal combustion in engine vehicle so there has to be a crossover point and we will have a look at that as well but right now we will move our focus to the fuel production part of this life cycle analysis because different powertrains use different fuel it is um, important to understand how these fuels are produced and what environmental impact do these have so let's get started so just recall this image after seeing this part we are now going to learn about the fuel production which includes various kinds of fuel for different powertrains as we saw in one of the images previously the vehicle use phase um, it's categorized into well to wheel and well to wheel basically means the entire process from the the mining of the fuel or from the crude oil from the ground or any kind of gases that we might be using and until how much tailpipe emissions the burning or the use of that fuel creates these days we have many different kind of fuels like cng lpg diesel gas and even hydrogen is one of the fuels so processing and transportation of these fuels they all add up to the well to wheel part in the well to wheel part we have two divisions again one is well to tank and the other one is tank to wheel so if we just discuss about the well to tank part and pick uh, either diesel or gasoline as an example from the point the crude oil is mined until the point it is delivered to the petrol station that part is well to tank and so it is also going through transportation and the emissions produced in the transportation phase are also added to this cycle for transporting fuels like petrol and diesel they are transported in trains and ships uh, for 
any intercontinental transport there are large ships that carry these petrol and diesel products and within the same country there are various pipelines or even trains that contain tankers that transport these and so the way these ships and trains are operated they add to the carbon footprint if the train is running on electric um, supply then the impact on the carbon footprint will be slightly lesser than a train that is running on diesel engines so unlike these fuels electricity is also used as fuel by the battery electric vehicle and the way this electricity is transported is by electrical wires and the process of setting up these electrical wires and the production of electricity contributes the uh, carbon footprint of the well to wheel of a battery electric vehicle so let's have a look at the image over here and pick a gasoline just as an example so you can see that this part is the well to tank part of the global warming potential of a IC engine vehicle over its lifetime and you can see this is quite high and by 2050 it is expected to reduce a little bit and also the production GWP is also expected to reduce a little bit but if you come down over here this production bar is very low so it basically costs more uh, in terms of global warming potential compared to a gasoline than you would do for a battery electric vehicle and you have this well to tank bit which is basically the global warming potential of electricity production and this is also a really big bar compared to this but then you have this part which is the tank to wheel or the global warming potential and co2 emissions when these gasoline is being burned inside the internal combustion engine and so this part is really big that's just expected to come down but if you look at the battery electric vehicle or fuel cell electric vehicle this is there is no tank to wheel part and the well to wheel part is expected to shrink to a very small level by 2050 because the electricity production would have been a bit more environment friendly and similarly when it comes to fuel cell electric vehicle there is a huge global warming potential for the production of hydrogen which is going to be used as fuel but again if you look by 2050 the forecast is that the well to tank part or the hydrogen production is going to be less carbon intensive than what it is currently right now and there's a big difference as well and so with this difference and no tank to wheel um, carbon emissions this fuel cell electric vehicle by 2050 is going to be much more environmentally friendly than compared to petrol or diesel vehicle by 2050 because you can see the total figure over here they are far less when it comes to battery and fuel cell electric vehicle and because the market cannot be dominated by just one kind of powertrain these two powertrains have a significant place in the overall spread of the market share so we have seen the well to wheel impact of the production of conventional fuels like petrol or diesel or cng let's have a look at some of the alternative fuels that are coming up in the in this environmentally friendly scenario and one of those is biofuels so for biofuels you have biodiesel and you also have bio petrol or biogasoline biofuels are essentially fuels that are produced from renewable biological resources so these include all the plants and any municipal and industrial weight waste but ma majorly it is uh, synthesized from plants that have like sugarcane or corn and any kind of vegetation which has certain properties and then after certain processing they are converted into fuels that have combustion and they can release heat the energy released per unit mass of these biofuels is actually greater than the energy released in unit mass of conventional fossil fuels like petrol or diesel and so that is why you can burn less amount of fuel to achieve the same amount of energy output and so th as you can see then that would help in reducing the fuel consumption and overall carbon impact so every gallon of biofuel that replaces a gallon of fossil fuel it will help in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions because from the same amount of fuel we, you would have re released more energy and so in a vehicle if you can release more energy from a small amount of fuel you can travel the same amount of distance for a less amount of fuel 
It also causes less harmful carbon emissions compared to the standard diesel or petrol because of the different composition of the biofuel. It is still producing some kind of carbon emissions but because it is not a petroleum based product and it is synthesized from plants, it has some kind of carbon impact but it has much less harmful carbon emissions compared to uh, standard fossil fuel. Manufacturers these days are producing engines that can run on a mixture of conventional and biofuels and they are called flex fuel engines and so the fuels they have a certain level of mixture of conventional and then biofuel and so this is one of the ways that the uh, manufacturers are trying to make their engines more environmental friendly. Also because these biofuels are produced from plant-based products it encourages increasing the amount of uh, vegetation and as you know vegetation helps to absorb carbon dioxide and so it overall helps to bring the carbon emissions down even before the production phase and even in the use phase it has a lesser um, lesser impact on the carbon emissions and global warming potential and let's understand the biofuel carbon footprint with the use of this image so it shows how much carbon intensity the different stages of production has. So you have the production of soybean and so because um, vegetation actually absorbs the carbon dioxide from the air all the vegetation and in this example it's soybeans all the vegetations actually just absorb carbon from the atmosphere and you can just see that different stages have different uh, carbon intensity and this is the overall carbon intensity. In this whole process this part you can see that it has a negative carbon intensity and so this constitutes a lot towards reducing the overall carbon intensity and this is not something you would see in the production of conventional fuel of petrol and diesel because there is actually nothing that absorbs CO2 in this entire process and every stage of production of fuel is just releasing carbon in the atmosphere and so the more biofuel we use the more reduction that will cause in the just in the production phase of the this fuel. Now let's have a look at how the electricity is produced and because electricity is also used as a fuel it is important to have a look at various ways of produ producing electricity and how they affect the environment. Electricity is used in every single process of the manufacturing. It is used in the production of raw material, processing of the raw material, assembly of the vehicle and then it is also used at the end of its life cycle for the recycling of various parts because all of the machinery used in this, all these processes is run by electricity. So it is important that we consider where we are getting the electricity from. And because of the source of electricity, it can add a great deal of carbon in the production phase and also in the recycling phase. The electric vehicle, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and also the fuel cell electric vehicles with a plug-in option, they all use the electricity from the grid and that charges the battery. Electric vehicles especially have only electricity being used as a fuel unlike a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle where you have a petrol engine with electricity and in a fuel cell you have hydrogen with electricity and so if we are using just electric vehicles the impact of electricity generation in the overall um, carbon footprints in its life cycle is very important. Only if electricity is produced from clean energy sources like renewable energy sources or even nuclear energy sources because nuclear energy production is not very carbon intensive but apart from nuclear, wind, solar and all of these kinds of um, energy sources can help reduce the carbon footprint of the life cycle. But on the other hand, if electricity is only being produced by coal power plants and other power plants that run on uh, natural gas or any kind of fossil fuel then it's not going to help us because we are just shifting the carbon released during the uh, driving phase of the vehicle and we are adding it to the fuel production and especially coal used as a fuel for producing electricity is very very carbon uh, intensive and it releases a lot of carbon dioxide and using electricity from that coal produced source is it's not uh, going to solve the problem of global warming reduction it's just solving the local problem of reducing pollution in the cities and nothing else. 
to help us understand how much impact these battery electric vehicles or any kind of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles will make in the carbon emissions let's understand the electricity production methods of various countries so the pie chart that you're looking at is a distribution of the source used in the production of electricity in the us and if you look closely 37 percent comes from petroleum and 32 percent comes from natural gas and these two are fossil fuels so we are increasing the carbon emissions in the electricity production even though the vehicle is not producing any carbon but there is a slice which is 11 percent and this 11 percent is renewable and so it does not produce any carbon as you understand for renewable energy sources and only if the renewable energy sources are used to charge the batteries of any kind of electric or hybrid vehicle only then we can actually achieve a reduction in the overall carbon footprint and that also applies to nuclear as we discussed earlier nuclear is not um, very uh, carbon intensive but it has other environmental impacts associated with it so the more renewable energy we produce the more profoundly we will be able to address the problem of global warming another example is uh, germany and so the picture in germany looks better than uh, us as you can see that the renewables have a 40 percent share of the total electricity production and recently germany has achieved a state where they produce more electricity from renewable sources of energy than compared to any fossil fuel and so it makes a lot of sense in places like this to have more electric powered vehicles either just battery electric or hybrid electric and so because of this source of electricity the overall carbon footprint it will eventually come quite low similarly in the uk the renewables have 35 percent share which is a, a very decent amount of a share for the sources for electricity but this data is from 2019 and in in recent days uk has also been able to achieve the crossover point where they have more renewable energy than compared to fossil fuel energy looking at the energy outlook of india we can see that the coal is a very highly preferred source for creating the electricity a lot of electricity generation plants are powered by coal and some are powered by oil but renewable is uh, a bit lower in the bottom but by 2030 the amount of renewable energy or the renewable electricity produced is expected to increase by quite a lot and so until the point comes where this renewable energy uh, electricity production is quite high and the electricity produced from coal is low the electric vehicles being running on the roads will have overall large carbon footprint impact compared to countries where more electricity is coming from renewable energy sources as we have seen that electric vehicles or any kind of vehicle that have batteries the manufacturing of those require more energy compared to conventional vehicle and the primary reason for that is the manufacturing of the lithium ion batteries lithium ion battery production requires a lot of extraction of lithium and rare earth metals that uh, go into the electrodes and other components and just in general the material used for the casing and for isolation electrical isolation and connections all of these materials they add to the carbon footprint of the lithium ion battery production so the electricity powering the plants where the batteries are produced also again add to the emissions if electricity is coming from fossil fuels then the carbon footprint in the battery production will increase even further in addition to the production of raw material like lithium and rare earth metal they already produce carbon emissions when they are being extracted and processed so that they can be used in the battery and so if the factory where the batteries are being assembled if they are not running from clean fuel then the carbon footprint will be increased even further this image shows another comparison of the carbon emissions per kilometer of driving in various countries and this takes into account different stages like lithium ion battery production and other manufacturing processes and the tailpipe emissions and so you can see that right now the conventional engine vehicles they have much higher co2 emissions and the most efficient conventional vehicles have still higher emissions than any other vehicle but you can see over here that in germany the overall sum total of different stages 
it's close to the most efficient conventional powered vehicles and so in other countries like Norway and France this uh, total carbon emissions is much lower and so this is where the electricity production source plays a major role and this is the 2015 uh, study and so from that point until now uh, countries like Germany have increased the production of renewable sources by a huge amount and so this bar that you see in the current scenarios would have been somewhere down here and as the country is pushed to produce more and more clean electricity these all bars will come down but this will stay more or less the same there is a saturation in how much uh, carbon emissions you can uh, reduce in the life cycle of a conventional vehicle but there is more work that you can do in reducing the life cycle impact of the electric vehicle and that is clearly visible in these graphs in various countries and the more work these countries have done to make their countries more green the better electric vehicles will give a result so we have seen that the manufacturing of any kind of electric vehicles with batteries produces more carbon dioxide but the driving of these vehicles does not produce any carbon dioxide so it must be driven for a certain amount of kilometers to become carbon neutral if you take a conventional vehicle as long as you keep driving it you will be increasing the amount of co2 but that is not the case for any kind of zero emissions vehicle and so after being driven a certain amount of kilometers you would be saving on the carbon dioxide that would have been otherwise released if you were driving a conventional vehicle and so after that point of time where you become carbon neutral any further driving that is being done by that vehicle is eventually contributing towards reducing the global warming potential in the life cycle of that vehicle also the cumulative energy demand of an ic engine vehicle is higher than electric vehicle because you will always be burning fossil fuel to run the vehicle until the vehicle is not um, fit to drive anymore you will always be increasing the carbon dioxide potential or global warming potential but that is not the case with electric vehicle and after crossing that uh, carbon neutral point you will all be saving the amount of carbon increased so the electric vehicle has to be driven by roughly 30,000 kilometers according to a study done in Europe and after being driven more than 30,000 kilometers you will be saving the carbon emissions and you will be reducing the global warming potential but this 30,000 kilometer number depends highly on the source of electricity as we seen if it is coming from fossil fuel then this figure can be higher or it can be lower based on where it's coming from so let's study a bit about battery recycling we have seen the issues and the details of battery manufacturing and where carbon is coming from let's study how it uh, happens in the recycling a lot of lithium ion batteries that are taken out of either battery electric vehicle plug-in hybrid vehicles or fuel cell electric vehicle all of these lithium ion batteries can be reused for stationary charge storage applications after the uh, the vehicle use phase is complete the vehicle use phase is very dynamic in nature but for stationary storage charges the changes in the power demand is not um, as high and as dynamic as you would have in an electric vehicle so even though they are not that uh, fit for use in an automotive application they still have a lot of um, energy storage capacity left inside them and so they are very good for use in stationary storage applications these batteries have a lot of rare earth metals in their anodes and cathodes like cobalt and nickel the extraction and processing of these rare earth metals takes a lot of money and so recycling these metals is the greatest economic incentive for battery recycling currently there are also a lot of other non-active materials used in the manufacturing of the battery what i mean by non-active materials is the materials that do not take part in the chemical reaction for the storage of electricity but these materials are used for creating the uh, housing of the battery and the the housing of the cells and just the packaging and also for uh, connections and electrical isolation and these kind of um, purposes they have materials like steel and aluminium and they can be recycled the batteries have different kinds of materials 
and different materials used in the electrodes and different kind of electrolytes that are used in the battery. So if there is a lithium ion battery recycling plant and if it is receiving lithium ion batteries from different sources, all of these batteries will have different electrolytes and different electrodes. And so they cannot follow the same exact procedure for uh, recycling these different batteries with the different chemicals inside them. And so that is one of the challenges that is being faced by the battery recycling and the industry is trying to find one single and simple process where all of the different kinds of lithium ion battery chemicals can be recycled. We also have to be careful in handling the batteries that come for recycling because if they have any amount of charge left inside them, if we start to disassemble a battery that has some charge left inside it, uh, it's going to be a disaster. So we need to make sure that we discharge the battery properly before attempting to recycle it. And also the way these batteries are disassembled is important because if it's not disassembled properly, some parts of the battery may not be uh, worth recycling. And so you'll just have to discard them. And we want to recycle as much as possible. So the disassembly of the lithium ion batteries has to be done properly. So let's quickly conclude the things that we have learned in this video. Vehicles until now were using diesel and petrol as their primary fuel, but XEVs, which is either battery electric vehicle, hybrid electric or fuel cell electric vehicle, these are all denoted by XEVs over here. And they use various alternative fuel to run the vehicle like electricity or hydrogen. To produce these conventional fossil fuels like diesel, petrol, etc., you have to extract crude oil and the gases, and then they have to go through the fractional distillation process, especially for diesel and petrol. And after fractional distillation is done, you have to transport these so that they can be used by the vehicles. And this entire um, supply chain has carbon at every carbon emissions at every step of its way. And so they, it leaves a carbon footprint even before the fuel is burnt. Battery manufacturing is also a highly carbon intensive process because of the material used in it like lithium and all the rare earth metals. So the mining and processing of these material and also running the battery manufacturing factory itself, these again all add to the carbon footprint. Battery recycling also helps to reduce carbon footprint but it also has to be run using the the plants that recycle battery has to be run using the electricity and so how much uh, carbon footprint we can reduce by recycling the components of the battery depends a lot on again the electricity supply and the source for production to give you an understanding of how much we can get back from the recycling of various vehicles at the end of their life, we can have a look at this image once again. This gray bar that you can see is the end of life. And so this is basically the reduction in the global warming potential. This all is the positive global warming potential, but over here, these gray bars are on the negative side. And so you can see that the battery electric vehicles, they have some kind of global warming potential at the end because of the recycling and the same goes for fuel cell electric vehicle but the diesel and gasoline vehicles they don't have much to give back in terms of recycling and so they don't have a lot of negative global warming potential they only increase the global warming potential and so with this image that we can see and the discussion we had we can conclude this video and in the next video, we will focus more about hydrogen and the, the ways in which hydrogen is produced, just like we saw about the electricity. Because this course is mostly about fuel cell electric vehicle, we have to give more focus on hydrogen production. And so that's what we will do in the next video. So stay tuned.